This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Seventeen-year-old Kurt Silver disappeared after an impromptu party. Five days later, Kurt's body was found, but no cause of death could be determined. No one knows how or why he died. Last May, two boys found a rock card with mysterious symbols. Suddenly, a phenomenal run of good luck began. They believe the rock has special powers. In New Mexico, a Catholic priest was lured to an isolated truck stop and abducted. In Montana, another priest mysteriously vanished. Authorities fear a priest killer may be on the loose. 1949, Chongqing, China. As a communist revolution of Mao Zedong sweeps the country, an American GI named Melvin Nellis is shipped back to the States, forced to leave behind his girlfriend and their five-year-old son, John. More than two decades later, the boy is a grown man, one of thousands of refugees fleeing Vietnam during the fall of Saigon. Today, John Nellis is an American citizen with a good job and a new family. But the painful memories of Vietnam are still fresh. Like his father before him, John Nellis left behind a young son when he came to the United States. Join me. Perhaps you can help reunite a family torn apart by war. October the 28th, 1981, in Newburgh Heights, Ohio, a suburb of Cleveland, three young boys made a gruesome discovery. Wow. Is it a dummy? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's real. Let's get out of okay. here. The body the young boys found seemed to have been deliberately placed where it lay. Apart from some minor scratches and bruises, there was no sign of injury. One tennis shoe was in a pile of rocks 12 feet away. The other shoe was missing. Several hours later, the body was positively identified as 17-year-old Kurt Sova. An autopsy revealed that Kurt had died 24 to 36 hours before his body was found but he had been missing for five days. I would like to know where Kurt was these five days. I would like to know how he died, what caused his death. I'm sure somebody knows because somebody put him there. Somebody either was with him when he died or somebody came upon him after he died and evidently panicked and put him down there. They didn't want to be caught with him. Ken and Dorothy Sova called Unsolved Mysteries in a final effort to find answers to the questions that plagued them. Where was Kurt during the five days he was missing? Did he die in the vacant lot, or was his body placed there? And is it really possible for a perfectly healthy 17-year-old boy to die without any apparent cause? The sudden, unexpected death of a teenager is always tragic. But for Ken and Dorothy Sova, the tragedy is compounded by the mysterious circumstances surrounding Kurt's disappearance and death. Kurt Sova lived with his parents in this quiet blue-collar neighborhood on the outskirts of Cleveland. He was the youngest of Ken and Dorothy Sova's four sons and the closest to his parents. He never had any trouble with the neighbors. I never had any trouble with him in school. I never had any trouble with him with the police. That's why I can't understand what happened.
Kurt left home for the last time on Friday, October 23rd, late in the afternoon. One block from his house, Kurt met up with a friend of his. How you doing? Hey, what's up? <laughs> Nothing much. How about you? Right. Hey, party tonight. Yeah, where? Uh, Sue's house. That's it. Tonight? Yeah, why not? Well, I was, Friday. Yeah, I was planning on going to the haunted house. Kurt Sova never returned home. It was wow. not like him to be gone overnight. It was not like him to stay out after 10, 10, 30, 11 o'clock, the latest. And that was only when he, we knew where he was. This night, he just never came home. By Saturday morning, Kurt's parents were worried. Dorothy began calling Kurt's friends while Ken scoured the area. We searched all the neighborhoods, all the places that we figured Kurt would be. And uh, as that day went by, looking for him, nobody turned Kurt up. And I started getting really worried. Thank you. On Sunday, the Sovas registered Kurt as a missing person with the Cleveland police. Meanwhile, Dorothy papered the neighborhood with missing flyers. Oh, yeah, we searched the ravines, the searched the schoolyards. I even went so far as to search dumpsters looking for him. On Sunday afternoon, Dorothy turned up a lead. Kurt's friends told her that he had been at a party Friday night in Newburgh Heights, less than two miles from where the Sovas lived. Dorothy went to the duplex where she had heard the party was held. Yeah? Are you Susan? No, Susan isn't here right now. When I went when there, the girl who well, had the party was not there. It was another girl. She claimed she was babysitting and that the other girl was working. Do you know anything about a party that was here last Friday? No. Could you possibly have Susan call me when she gets home? Tell her sure. it's real important. Sure. Let me give you my name and phone number. All right. Please have her call me. Yeah, all right. Thank okay. you. All right. When the girl returned home that had rented that apartment, she called me. And she said she never saw my son and she had no party. Despite what the woman named Susan told Dorothy Sova, a pizza delivery man stated that indeed there had been a party at the duplex on Friday night. Dorothy contacted Susan again, and this time she admitted Kurt had been there. More than a dozen people had dropped by, some of them older than Kurt, most of them people he had never met before. Susan told Dorothy that Kurt had been drinking very heavily. Those who knew him say that Kurt was not much of a drinker, and his slight build added to his low tolerance for alcohol. I was shocked to hear Kurt was drinking. I never knew him to drink. <laughs> I'm sure if everyone else was drinking, he probably was drinking at that party. I never knew him or his normal friends to drink. But these were not his normal friends he was with this night. They were all a whole new group of people. Come on. The fellow that Kurt went to the party with told us that Kurt had become ill. He took him outside for some air, and because it was a chilly night, he said he went upstairs to get Kurt's jacket, and he left him hanging on the fence. He said he went up to get his jacket and came back down, and Kurt was gone. Kurt! That's when I think I became hysterical. I thought, my God, something to happen to him at that party or in between the party and home. Only I didn't, in my wildest dreams, expect him to turn up dead. On Wednesday, October the 28th, five days after he left home, Kurt Sova's body was found in a ravine on Harvard Street. He was found just 500 yards from the duplex where he had last been seen alive. We have a young male, probably about 16 or 17. It's our belief that his body was dumped out there, and whoever the person or persons were knew the area.
and they knew that people go back there and ride dirt bikes and Guys, kids play back roll. there. So they knew that eventually, within a certain amount of time, that he would be found. The police combed the area for clues. They found Kurt's left shoe wedged in some rocks less than 12 feet away from his body. They were never able to locate his right shoe. Photo 29. Kurt's body was taken to the Cuyahoga County Coroner's Office for an autopsy. The coroner determined that Kurt had died 24 to 36 hours before his body was found, which meant that he had been alive for at least three days after he left the party. What the coroner could not determine, however, was the exact cause of death. On the basis of the things that we saw, and equally important, the things that we did not see, what was absent, we felt that Kurt Sova had died from instantaneous physiologic death, and the manner of death in this particular case was signed out as probable accidental, because we eliminated everything else. He hadn't been beaten in any way. He hadn't been traumatized in any way. He, hadn't been, he didn't have enough alcohol to end his life. He had no pre-existing natural disease. And as Sherlock Holmes said, you eliminate all other possibilities, and that which remains is the truth. This was a diagnosis by exclusion. I didn't believe that they couldn't tell me how Kurt died, which is immaterial to me, what they put on that piece of paper. For my peace of mind, I want to know what happened to my boy. But I'm not really sure I want to know who put him in that ravine. I couldn't do that to somebody's animal, let alone a human being. I just want to know what happened to my boy. After the initial shock of Kurt's death had abated, Dorothy Silva began to piece together a series of strange events that had occurred during the five days when her son was missing. On Monday, three days after Kurt disappeared, one of his friends, David Trusnick, claims he saw Kurt and another boy walking along a busy street less than a mile from the Silva home. I was on my way to a job interview. It was on a Monday morning, and I spotted Kurt. And he was with somebody I didn't recognize. And I pulled over to offer Kurt a ride. At this point, a van pulled up, and Kurt yelled out, Franco. They both ran over to the van, and they got in the van. I didn't know Kurt was missing. If I would have knew he was missing, there would probably been something I could have done. I could have followed the van. I could have did something, you know, but I didn't know. And two days later, he was found dead. So that was the last time I seen him. Also on Monday, a stranger who had been seen hanging around the Sova's neighborhood noticed Kurt's missing poster in the window of a local record store. There you go. Thank you. OK, we'll see you later. All right, bye-bye. Can I help you with something? See that picture of that boy over there? Yeah, what about it? Uh, you might as well take it down. You're going to find him dead in two days. Nobody's going to know why he died. The manager was skeptical. However, she soon had a reason to take the stranger seriously. The next day, um, before the record shop had opened, he left uh, flowers and a note. And the note said, roses are red, the sky is blue, they found him dead, and they'll find you too. Police questioned him, and they said he was a crazy from Detroit. And I didn't see him after that. Because Kurt was only missing at this point, the police released the young man from Detroit. Later, when Kurt was found dead, the man had disappeared. Then on Wednesday, the very day Kurt's body would be found, Dorothy Silver received an early morning phone call from Susan, a young woman who lived in the duplex where Kurt had been drinking on Friday night. I got a phone call at 3.30 in the morning. And she told me that someone was sleeping in her basement, and perhaps it was Kurt. And I thought, why are you calling me now after lying to me so many times? I didn't know whether to believe her or not believe her. My wife told me that <clears throat> the girl called oh, about 3 o'clock in the morning and 
told her that she thinks that Kurt was sleeping in the basement. I proceeded to go over the house there, and I went down to the basement. And I thought maybe he was sick or he was hurt, and I figured if I got down there and found him, then maybe I could do something for him. There I found a cot that it looked like somebody had slept in there. But after searching the whole basement, I didn't find anybody in there. I have no idea if it was Kurt or not. All I know is somebody did sleep in that cot that night. And when I got there, they were gone. I think Kurt was there. I think he was already dead in that cot. But I think they panicked and got rid of his body in that ravine. Whether or not Kurt had died in the basement, Dorothy and Ken Silva are positive of one thing. 24 hours before his body was found, Kurt was not in the ravine. Ken Silva had searched there and found nothing. I knew it wasn't there the day that I was searching. So they must have dumped it off that evening. I looked around, and I'm sure that if Kurt was down there, I would have noticed that bright yellow t-shirt that he had on against any of the terrain. Finally, three months after Kurt's death, Dorothy had reason to be suspicious again. The death of a boy Kurt used to know, Eugene Kvet, seemed to have an eerie resemblance to Kurt's. Eugene was found in another ravine on Harvard Street two and a half miles from the place Kurt's body had been discovered. Both boys had been missing for some time preceding their deaths, and Eugene Kvet's right shoe was also never found. The mysterious death of Kurt Sova leaves a trail of disturbing questions in his wake. How exactly did Kurt die? Where had he been for the five days after he left home? Had Kurt slept in the basement of the duplex? Was there any connection between Kurt's death and the death of Eugene Kvet? Seven years later, Dorothy and Ken Sova are still searching for answers. We still don't know any more than the day we went out looking for him. But I believe that somebody out there knows exactly what happened to Kurt, and they're just being quiet about it. I don't think I will ever come to peace with myself until I find my answers. And if I don't find out through this program, I'll keep on searching. I'll search to the day I'm buried myself. I will never give up because I don't believe that a normal, healthy boy just walks away and disappears for five days and then ends up dead in a ravine. I know somebody knows what happened to him. April 1975, South Vietnam. As Saigon fell to the North Vietnamese, thousands of refugees fought to leave the country. To John Nellis, the son of a Vietnamese woman and an American soldier, this exodus was a nightmare. Under the cloak of darkness, John and his wife, to be Vivian, jumped into the back of a truck for the first step in a journey that was to take them to the United States. They narrowly avoided being shot by angry South Vietnamese troops. I was real terrified because I was thinking, we will make it. We thought we were, uh, um, we got a chance to get out of the country. But we don't know exactly where we're going. John and Vivian were lucky. They managed to escape. But today, the turmoil in John's life continues. 
The history of 20th century Asia has been marked by violent war and revolution. 42-year-old John Nellis's life has been torn apart by these conflicts. For when John was still a child, his American father was swept from his life by the bloody rise of China's Mao Tung. And in 1973, as the United States was withdrawing from Vietnam, John's infant son disappeared in the chaos that marked the ending of another war. Today, this new American citizen needs your help to finally close this tragic circle by reuniting with a son he wants to know and the father he never knew. John's father's name was Melvin Nellis. He was an American serviceman John's mother met during the mid-1940s in Chongqing, China. Chongqing was to become a focal point for the revolution sweeping China as the nationalist regime of Chiang Kai-shek was swept from power by the communist army of Mao Zedong. Melvin Nellis was stationed in Chongqing, and there he met, lived with, and loved John's mother. OK, it's ready. Here you go, it's dinner time. Are you hungry? Yeah. OK, great. When John was five years old, his father was shipped back to the States. Still wish he could come with me. As his father and mother were not legally married, she could not follow him to the United States. Okay. Melvin Nellis promised to write, but eventually the letter stopped. John never heard from his father again. My mother did not let me go with my father because I am the only child she has. And also in the uh, Asia culture, the boy is the foundation of the family. My mother also wanted me to be around with her just in case I can support her when she grew. Oh. In 1952, John and his mother moved to her homeland, South Vietnam. At this time, the Vietnam War was gathering momentum. John's mother made a marginal living selling produce, but was still able to save just enough money to send her son to private schools. There he was able to learn English and receive a Western education. My mother, she did make a lot of sacrifice for me. She has to spend at least two-thirds of her income to send me to that school. In 1957, John's mother took her son to the United States Embassy in Saigon. This is my son, John. Hello, John. Hi. How are you? I'm John Quinn. Won't you have a seat? What can I do for you? I would like to register my son for immigration to go to the United States. After my mother lost contact with my father, she has a financial hardship. So she was thinking of sending me to the United States because she was afraid that she could not take care of me. At the embassy, she was able to secure a registration document that proved that John's father was an American. This document was to be vital in his later emigration to the United States. As the war in Vietnam escalated, John's personal life also went through dramatic changes. He met a woman and fathered her child. Then in 1971, she left him and took John's son. In 1973, she married an American Marine, and John believed that the couple had taken the boy with them to the United States. First of all, I feel a little sad because I lost, uh, you know, just like I lost a son. But I feel happy because he can go to the United States, has a proper education, have a better life, so he doesn't end up like myself. In April of 1975, John and his new girlfriend Vivian were on one of the last planes leaving Saigon. I was uh, taking a last look down through the door when the plane up high, you know, I see all the light of the city. And I know this is, uh, this is just a uh, goodbye. And I say, well, finally, I make the trip to the United States. Later, after John had settled in America, he was to learn that his boy had been left behind in the chaos and carnage that had overtaken Vietnam. 
After John and Vivian's daring escape, they were married. They currently live in an affluent suburb in Orange County, California, where John works as an electronics technician. In 1986, the couple became citizens, and they have a three-year-old daughter, Vienna. Despite John's newfound happiness, his life is full of loose ends. He has lost both his father and his son, and longs to be reconciled with both. If my father and my son watching me right now, I would like to tell them how much I miss them and I love them, and, uh, and I like to reunite it and see them again. John's father, Melvin Nellis, served in China in the late 1940s. His last letters to his Asian family were mailed from Ohio. Melvin Nellis would today be between 60 and 70 years old. Thanks to our broadcast, John Nellis learned that his father is now retired and living in Tokyo, Japan. Incredibly, just three weeks later, John's search for his son Daniel also came to an end when they were reunited after more than 17 years. For so many years, I miss him. I think of him all the time, and I'm so happy to see him. This is a real dream come true, and it's a miracle. When I saw my dad, I was so excited and very happy. When I looked into his eyes and saw his family, I found happiness. Daniel's first day in America was overwhelming. Not only did he reunite with his father, he also met his stepmother and half-sister for the first time. Now he's uh, with me. I'm going to do my best. You know, give him a good chance in life and a better future for him. Yeah, and make up for what he has lost. Come on, I'll say cheese. In a moment, the story of two priests connected by a violent and unexplained fate. Someone may have a vendetta against clergy, and that someone is still at large. When they're ordained, Catholic priests vow to become servants of God and servants of their community. Their door is always open to those in need, but their faith can place them in jeopardy. A priest's willingness to help, no matter who, no matter when, no matter where, can even threaten his own life. Father Ronaldo Rivera of Santa Fe, New Mexico has been murdered, and Father John Kerrigan of Ronan, Montana has mysteriously disappeared. Authorities fear these two cases, 1,000 miles and two years apart, may be connected. It is even possible that there's a serial killer at large who is exclusively murdering Catholic priests. St. Francis Cathedral, Father Gerard speaking. On the evening of August 7th, 1982, a call for help was telephoned to the rectory of St. Francis Cathedral in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I have impaired vision. I cannot drive at night, but could you call back in a few minutes? I'm sure another father will Father Patrick Gerard couldn't leave the rectory and asked the caller to telephone again in 15 minutes. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Exactly 15 minutes later, the telephone rang again. This time, Father Ronaldo Rivera took the call. This is Father Ronaldo. Hello, Father. I need the help of a priest. My grandfather is dying. Oh, sorry, the caller was insistent. Father, uh, he wanted a priest to come immediately to administer the last rites. Are you familiar with the rest stop just south of Santa Fe? Yes, yes, I am. Well, how long will it take you to get there? I can be there in 20 minutes. And I'll see you there. The man said his name was Michael Carmelo and that he was telephoning from a rest stop near Waldo, New Mexico, 20 miles away. Goodbye, Father.
Father Rivera left that evening to meet someone at the rest area in Santa Fe. This was on a Thursday evening. He was reported missing Thursday night, didn't show up Friday. It was on a broadcast made that Father Rivera was missing. Obviously, we had a location, at least we knew it was Waldo, somewhere in that area, because the priest remembered Waldo, New Mexico. We had hundreds of volunteers, hundreds of citizens volunteer their time to come out to the Waldo area, and we searched on horseback. They had four-wheel drives. We had hundreds of people walking the area, combing all the hills and the desert for him. Probably 90% of the people in Santa Fe knew who he was, or he had some impact in their lives at one time or another. Two days after the search began, Father Rivera's body was found on a deserted road three miles from the rest stop. At Father Rivera's funeral, the entire city mourned, devastated by his brutal murder. From Saturday until his burial, the city was just awe-stricken. Whether you were Lutheran, Catholic, Protestant, Jew, we were just all one at that time. The very fact that he went out there on this call was an act of charity, an act of love. I think because he showed this love for people, the people just responded. And so when he died, I think there was that uh, sadness in their heart for somebody that they loved. Everybody loved Father Renan. I'm sure he's happy where he is now. And we miss him. The night of the murder, a man calling himself Carmelo was waiting for Father Rivera at the rest stop in a blue pickup truck. Lieutenant Eulabri, has developed a theory of what happened next. The killers were probably there waiting for him. When he arrived at the rest area, they signaled him out. Father. Yes. Are you the priest they sent? Yes, I am. I'm Father Renato. Why don't you come with There's us? There's no Let's way on one on. individual Sorry, could have handled Father that's Rivera. That's he would have gave them a hard time. So there had to be at least two people involved. And we know they had a gun obviously, because he was shot. So I'm sure they controlled him with that weapon. But there had to be two people involved to subdue him, because he was a very strong individual. Unabri believes the killers took Father Rivera to a remote desert area. Go, go outside. Parkour, move! Get him out, get him out! He was not killed where he was found. They drove to a location, threw him on the ground, and they left. They could have hid him anywhere in that Waldo area, and there's several places in Waldo where you can hide a, hide a body and you never find it. So obviously they wanted him to be found. After the crime, the killers returned to the rest stop to remove Father Rivera's car. His vehicle was found in a rest area just east of Grants, New Mexico, which is about two hours from Santa Fe. There was no physical evidence found in the vehicle. We didn't find any fingerprints. There was no blood stains, nothing to indicate that someone had even driven the car. It had been wiped clean. The Santa Fe police had few clues, and after a nationwide check, they found no suspects named Michael Carmelo. As far as motive, Father Rivera was not the target. A Catholic priest was the target, for whatever reason. Robbery was not a motive, because there's nothing taken from the priest other than his last rites kit, and that's a possibility for a souvenir. Apparently, the killer would like to relive the experience. Every time he looks at it, he remembers killing a priest. Two years later, on August 8, 1984, in Ronan, Montana, 
another priest mysteriously disappeared. Father John Kerrigan was new to the Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Ronan. He had only been there four days before he too vanished. At 11 p.m. on the night he disappeared, Father Kerrigan went to a bakery across the street from the church to chat with his new parishioners. Welcome to Ronan. <laughs> Thank nice you. Nice to have you here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Good. Expect to see everybody here at church tomorrow. Mm -hmm. After a few minutes, he was returning home to go to bed. The next day, at a turnout along the highway that circles nearby Flathead Lake, a local fruit peddler discovered a pile of bloody clothes. Blood all over the shirt. After we realized that they were Father Kerrigan's, we did a search of that area around the cherry stand on the hill behind it. A bloody coat hanger was found close to the clothing. We concluded that the coat hanger could have been used to either tie someone up, could have been used to strangle someone, we believe Father Kerrigan, or also could have been used as a gag just no real way of determining exactly what the use was, but it definitely is connected to the clothing. And it wasn't just a hanger laying there, it had been deformed and definitely used for some purpose. A week later, Father Kerrigan's car was found abandoned five miles from the area where his clothes had been discovered. We know that car sat there where we found it for approximately a week before it came to our attention. We did a thorough search of that area, and we found the keys lying in tall grass. There was blood on the front seat, in the right door panel, on the right floorboard. I wonder if we got a body in the trunk here. found a shovel in the trunk with blood on it. We found a pillow in the trunk with blood on it. There was also blood splattered inside the trunk. The police were surprised to find $1,200 in Father Kerrigan's wallet. And the money was not hidden. It was just normally as it would have been kept in a wallet. And none of that was disturbed. So we don't feel that robbery was a motive for this particular crime. When Lieutenant Eulabry yeah. learned of Father Kerrigan's disappearance, he flew to Ronan to investigate the similarities between the two cases. Right here in this area, stacked up in the weeds. In both cases, the killer wanted people to know, I killed a priest. And here is the evidence to show I killed him. I still strongly believe that uh, whoever killed Father Rivera was involved with Father Kerrigan. There are other similarities between the two cases. Both victims' cars were driven away from the crime scene. A deformed metal coat hanger was found near Father Kerrigan's clothes, and there is evidence a coat hanger was used in Father Rivera's murder. In both cases, robbery was not a motive, and perhaps most significantly, both priests belonged to the select order of Franciscans. If there's other law enforcement agencies that have had a Catholic priest killed with some of the similarities we have just discussed here, we'd like to hear from them. There's a possibility we have a serial killer going killing Catholic priests. Next, the story of a family transformed by incredible luck. It all began with a boulder carved with mysterious symbols. Could a rock have the power to change people's fortunes? Our next story is part Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, and part fairy tale. What it all boils down to is this. Two boys in the state of Washington find a large rock covered with strange symbols deep in the forest. Then a phenomenal run of good luck begins. Is it coincidence or something more? You be the judge. On Saturday, May the 14th, 1988, deep in an isolated stretch of woods near the Canadian border, 
13-year-old Jamie Parks led his friend Trevor Johnson along the meandering path of Tumwater Creek. Jamie had found a special rock here and had decided to show it to his best friend. See, didn't I tell you? Wow, that's neat. Looks like people came and drew it with the stick eons of years ago. Yeah, I know. One that I'm kind of wondering about is that man in the corner. It could be a man or something. It's like a stamp. Maybe almost. the Martians came and did it. It's really neat. It's got all the aspects of nature. The only way that somebody could ever do that is if it was clay or they had yeah. some space age tool or something. Why don't we go tell my dad? Yeah, let's go. I felt just an immediate need to go down and see this rock. Um, his excitement was contagious and really piqued my interest. There it is, cool as it's deep. Yeah. And I turned and there was this beautiful rock with these markings on them. I'd never seen anything quite like it. I got a very immediate feeling that this rock had something to say. It really had something very positive to say about life to me. And being so challenged, uh, I got a great boost out of it. When I first saw the rock, I had the most eerie feeling. It was a good feeling, a very positive one, but it just, you can't say the words that the rock makes you feel like. From that day on, Steve and Patty Johnson's lives would take a dramatic turn for the better, and they would attribute it to the rock. Okay, just For years, the Johnson family had been struggling financially. Hi, help to help pay the bills, Patty took a job as a receptionist. Even so, they found themselves in debt. Things were just looking really sad. We were in a small apartment. Monies were not good. Patty and I were both working. I was working as a prison correctional officer. I wasn't happy with the position. The pay wasn't sufficient for us to be able to even meet some of our bills, to be quite honest about it. To improve their financial situation, the Johnsons plan to open a small 100-square-foot shop in a newly constructed local mall. Patty quit her job so she could run the shop, but the plan backfired when construction ran behind schedule. Instead of improving, their financial situation worsened. On May the 16th, 48 hours after Steve Johnson saw the rock for the first time, his luck began to change dramatically. Sure, Dennis, we can be right down. Honey, that was Dennis Loeb. You'd like to know if we could come down to the landing mall right away. Okay. Out of the blue, the ownership of the mall approaches us with, listen, we'd like you to open up a 1,000 square foot shop. Okay, this is the uh, space I had in mind for you. I was very upfront with him that we had no money to do that. And it wasn't a blinking of an eye, and the gentleman says, uh, well, we'll take care of getting your inventory. I really didn't overcome the shock at that time. I couldn't even ask an intelligent question, as I remember, to the guy uh, as to how they were going to do this. We were both flabbergasted. We just couldn't believe that there are people out there that want to help. Three weeks later, in early June, Stephen Patty's dress shop opened and was a resounding success other business opportunities began to spring up unexpectedly. Three days after the dress shop opened, Steve was offered a job as manager of the mall's only movie theater. The mall ownership was so impressed with Steve that in less than a month, they let him buy the theater outright for a very low price. Three months and one day after he saw The Rock, Steve opened a candy store, his third successful business venture in the mall. The Johnsons are convinced that their good fortune was related to the magical powers of the rock. Last September, archaeologist Rick McClure examined the rock and determined that the petroglyphs were not carved by American Indians. McClure feels that the symbols were made in this century and have no religious significance or magical powers. The Johnson's run of good luck continues unabated. Three months ago, they were offered a five-bedroom house for four years rent-free in return for making minor home repairs. 
For the Johnsons, it was a dream come true. Looking back at all the wonderful things that have happened, we're spending more time with our family, good quality time. Our income has grown to a point that we're actually being able to start to pay back people that have helped us over the years, and uh, those type of things bring a, a lot of pleasure to us. I don't know if it's superstition or not, or if it's good luck, but it just seems like since that's happened, things have changed and things have, have come about for us. Is the Johnson family's streak of good fortune related to the rock and its cryptic symbols? Most of us would probably call it a coincidence, but who knows? Sometimes the line between coincidence and something more mystical is an unsolved mystery. Join me next week for another edition of Unsolved Mysteries.